I was going to see before I started seeing like like me. I never really didn't know what the hell's about this. I was reading that philosophy. Okay, okay. okay. Do you have a hard to find out? No. Anyway, all the Parents so <laughs> <laughs> well, I had, I had, um, I had a girlfriend in Lance <laughs> that was yeah, buying on the desk. And so yeah. she would give it to me. Yeah. Yeah. Because normally yeah. that yeah. wouldn't have been yeah. kind of, I wouldn't have bought that. Because yeah. right. yeah. most of the books that I read are kind of like um, reference things in the back. So you know, have to kind of stuff. Yeah. 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 But anyway, yeah. so we're yeah. 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 about yeah. And then I went to this spontaneous virtual writing. And I regurgitated all the thoughts and ideas and visions that were in those books out, like somebody was taking it, shaking it upside down, and it was coming back out. There wasn't time to do it. Is it all set up? Yeah, I was going to tweet the link to the live stream. Well, yeah, that's just like a story. And as soon as I see that, I'll think, yeah, let's get here. I think it's pretty much the same thing. I just want to do a little bit of a thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah,
Okay. I'm glad. I, think that's your I know that is my video. But I'm not going to stand up though either. Hi, my name is Dan. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning. Dan. Um, I was going to do a presentation yesterday and it just didn't work out. So I figured the in-conference was better format for this anyways. Um, for people who don't know me, I probably known most around here as a podcaster, but I had, a, I had a podcast called Out of the Coffin where I talked about vampires for a couple of years. Before that, I had a podcast called Is This Thing On, which was just whatever came off my mind. That was my first podcast that was very rough and are still sadly up on the internet because nothing disappears once it goes online. Um, but I'm a software developer by trade, but when I have free time, I like to write trashy vampire novels. Trashy. Well, there's some trashy stuff. You were into trashy vampires before it was cool. That's right, I was. <laughs> so, when I was in college, I wrote this classic of literature, Lilith's Love. Um, Self-published it in 2000s. It's still available on Amazon. I intentionally made it this form factor, because this was before ebooks. I wanted the ability for people to take it and go. I did that on purpose. Unfortunately, the text is really tiny oh, when wow. you do that. <laughs> That's one of those lessons you learn. So you couldn't just make it when you self-publish. I I could have, but it costs more money uh, to resubmit. Page. Okay. Oh, to resubmit. Well, well, to resubmit, and then it would make the book more expensive. I didn't want to do that either. Okay. So this was a redo for when it was 15 anniversary. It's now 20 years old. Hey, Dan, hold that up to the camera, just so. No, no. I meant the, yeah. <laughs> the people who are actually on. Or viewing it later. Viewing yeah, it later. Sure. It's a recording. Um, <laughs> then I started podcasting about vampires, not as a means necessarily to promote this. It was just a natural extension of it. So I would talk about vampires with my wife. We'd talk about the latest movies, TV shows, True Blood, this year's new Dracula movie, that kind of thing. Um, and I started listening to other podcasts as well and started listening to a podcast called HorrorAddicts.net and have become a staff writer and podcaster with them and they produce anthologies from some of the stories that end up on the podcast. So the first one that they uh, produced is Horrible Disasters. These are all stories set during real disasters that have happened like volcanoes or earthquakes or tidal waves and all that craziness but then a horror story narrative goes through it to sort of either explain why that happened or while there's this earthquake you still have to deal with demons and things like that going on my story that's in this uh, was about the volcano that erupted in 1814 that the year later became known as the year without a summer that spawned the whole gothic fiction movement where uh, Frankenstein. yeah Frankenstein Shelley and, and Paul Dory got together when there was epic darkness ruled the land literally did after this volcano had spewed all this ash into the atmosphere and crops died and it was miserable and people were sick and it was horrible but these four people got together and they started writing ghost stories and they became Frankenstein and the vampire and all that. So my story evolves around that. So this is the first time I was published outside of my own work. And then this is an anthology that I put together for a group of writers uh, on Facebook. We called ourselves the Vampire Writers Support Group because we all needed to get together and say, nobody reads vampire stuff anymore. So we would all talk about, you know, our the ways we write and why we write and what kind of vampires we have in our stories. And then a bunch of people said, you know, I've got some stories I'm working on. I really wish there was an anthology coming out that we could put the story in. And Helium Hand, Dan Charette, said, hey, I'll put that together. <laughs> so I've got a story in it, but there are 13 awesome stories in here. They're all different kinds of vampires, different time periods really good stuff. I wanted to pass these out if anyone wants to check them out. These are my actual physical books. Uh, I might give one away if anyone's actually interested, but feel free to take a look. Those were all create space at one time or another, whether it was um, 
I forget what they called themselves before that, but it was they're now create space. So those are all Amazon produced paperback books. And there are Kindle versions and Smashwords versions of, of all of them as well. So what I wanted to talk about to at least start a conversation is are the tools, the programs that I use. But since this is a non-conference, it does not have to be about me talking. But if somebody wants to show what tools they want to use, we can come up, or I can just show what I use. Go ahead, start Let's one. start. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, That's what, we what I'd really like to do first is ask how many of you in here are currently writers, whether it's blogging or what. If you type and people can read it, OK. <laughs> Awesome. That sounds like that makes us a writer, right? I don't mean text. I write emails. Right, or emails. Yeah, text doesn't qualify because it's not spelled correctly. Right. A lot of technical writing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay. Technical writing. So, how many of you want to be a fiction writer? That's a goal or an aspiration, or you go, man, that book was stupid. I could do better than that. That's still inspiration. To write your own story. Screenwriter. Screenwriter? That's okay. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> um, I figure if anyone in here is a blogger, you're like one step short of that, right? Because you're already out there putting out your opinions, your thoughts, your ideas. You want to share them with people. And you're telling stories, even if it's financial or accounting or spiritual or, or anything. If you're, if you're, trying to communicate in a one-way direction with other people, then eventually you're going to go, you know, I had this really idea for a story, or that movie inspired something that it'd be really neat to write that. And maybe it becomes a short story. Maybe nobody ever reads it. But I'm of the opinion that if you have an idea and it takes over, because it does, when you get an idea, you can't shake the muse. She will not shut up. And you will wake up in the middle of the night, or you'll have an idea in the shower, or on your drive to work, or anything like that. Um, you've, it will drive you crazy until you write that down. And maybe you don't flesh it out into a story, but it gets out of your head, and you can come back to it later. So a lot of the tools that I like to use are note-taking type applications, especially Evernote. Um, Evernote.com is a tool that lets you just keep your notes in the cloud. But you can access them with any device. There's applications for your phone, your computer, your tablet, probably your smartwatch coming soon, I'm sure. You just talk into it like Dick Tracy and it'll dictate for you. That would be awesome. Um, yeah. Um, Evernote is probably where I keep all of my basic ideas. But the other cool thing about Evernote is the ability to pin stuff from a website. So if I happen to come across a thank you, if I happen to come across uh, a website with some interesting article or something, there's a plugin for almost every browser that lets you capture that text and save it as a note into Evernote. I use the paid service because I keep a bazillion notes. Um, I learned a long time ago that it was worth it. And it's $10 a month. Wow. But it is expensive. <laughs> but I've been using it for three years. It's worth every penny. Uh, everything is behind SSL. It's secured on their end. But you can also still encrypt anything you want if you're really paranoid. Which I use it for passwords, by the way. That's what I do. I'll keep my passwords in notes and then encrypt them. Then they're encrypted on this side before they even get to Evernote. But they're saved. And if I'm like somewhere else and I need to get my password, I get on my phone and get to my Evernote. But um, I've got notebooks for all kinds of things. This is just so wh whenever you want to clip something, you can decide which notebook you want to put it in. And that's just all the different topics of crap that I have. They're mostly organized, at least by my lizard brain. But you can, you can uh, clip a, an article just the way it is, or you can have it just strip the text out, things like that. Take snapshots you can draw on later, that kind of thing. So 
if if you learn anything today, Evernote is awesome. You don't even have to use it. Just know Evernote is awesome. Uh, but another tool I've discovered that I've been using a lot lately is this called Ginkgo. Uh, it's ginkgoapp.com. It is another note taker. It's completely in the web. There's no clients for this. But what it does is it lets you think like tree notes. So you have an idea and stuff expands off of it. If anyone's familiar with mind mapping, it's the same kind of concept, except imagine your node is over to the left and then you branch everything out to the right. There's no central idea that you branch off of, but it's exactly the same thing. Um, so the cool thing about this is you keep everything here on the web. You can make presentations out of it, which is what I was going to do. It's as simple as exporting to a presentation and you can just tab between all the different screens. All, every note is a different screen in this. Uh, that's just one of the features and that's this Ginkgo is absolutely free, but it only gives you three trees, which you can think of as three projects. So like, for example, this presentation, the writer's toolbox is one tree, but you can have, when you pay for it, and it's $5 a month, you can have as many trees as you want, but you can do anything you want with three trees. You could have one tree that still has every idea you've ever had in it. It would get really messy, but you could do that. But you could have one tree for your personal projects, one tree for your work projects, and one tree for just scattered brain dump notes. Um, I'm sorry? Be like the Pixar tree. Where the, there you go. All in the same universe. Right. So have you, you know, when, when I hear writers and author, other authors talk, mm -hmm. they almost always mention Scrivener. I was going to talk about that okay. too. Now, let me tell you, if how many people have heard of Scrivener? How many of you have used Scrivener? Okay. Do you like Scrivener? Yes and no. <laughs> okay. I mean, like, I can see like someone that's not as technical as me, because I prefer like Markdown. Okay. Simpler text format. This uses Markdown as well. Ginkgo does. Yes. Okay. So what's great about Scrivener, and I can bring it up, or we could just talk about it. How about the spelling on it? <clears throat> Scrivener. How do you yeah. spell it? Yeah. S C R I V N E R. Let me just bring it up over here. There it is. There's a note. Scrivener. 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 Um, it's a, an application for Mac and Windows. So that right there is a strike in my book against it because I like to be able to write wherever I am. And you can import stuff into Scrivener, but it's not it's as Windows easy. Yeah. The Windows doesn't. To the Mac. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, the Mac does almost everything. The Windows is a, like a few versions behind. Yeah. Whenever they feel like a good version update They're should Mac be done. So. Right. Well, I actually use a Mac for work and Windows at home. That's, I, that's <laughs> sort of weird. <laughs> Most people are like, how does that work? But, uh, and I actually bought Scrivener for both Mac and Windows to learn how to use the tool. That's $40 a pop. Do they, do they sync with each other? Yes and no. Or I could pull a Ruth. It depends. Yes. <laughs> you might, if you're going from Windows to Mac, you're probably okay. But if you're going from Mac to Windows, you might. Maybe. I don't know. It loses something in the translation when it goes back to so Windows. Okay, so there's, there's no like, like you can't say, here's my, my files in a common place that both applications. You can do. So uh, what they do recommend you use is like uh, Dropbox or any other cloud service. And between Macs, Absolutely, it totally works. But if you want to go from Mac to Windows, there is difference in how they work. And so if you try to open your project up... Again, just because the Windows software is inferior... It won't open everything correctly. There might be some so it really is sort of a, which computer do you really want to use? You should just yeah. stick with that. Yeah. And it's not that the Windows product is inferior. It does everything you need. The Mac version has got a lot more shiny bells and whistles and stuff that once you use them, you'll get used to them and want to keep using. But as a tool, but, but the tool, the tool, like from what I've heard, like the main thing is like you can like have like little notes of like if you're writing, you have a character, you can have like a note of like you know a character profile. Yes, that you can like easily refer to as you're writing your 
there's like organizational tools that people yeah. like, 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 you know, like, I don't know, back in the old days, we used those index cards and put right. stuff on there. They have that in there, bullets, so you can just look at your various topics or art, you know, sections as index cards and you organize them and move them around and then wow. put, like, you can know, you can use it as a notebook too, put stuff in there and then before you, you prepare your, your draft, you know. It's, it's cool. coming up. It's really slow. Um, no, and it's it's a it's a client. Here it is. Okay, I got to move it over to the other screen too. Give me just a second. So this is what he's talking about. You can have these little note cards view. You. you can drag them around, reorganizing here. So what's great about Scrivener is is if you're the type of person like I am where I don't just sit down and start typing start to end. No. Uh, an idea will come to me, I'll write it down, I'll expand on it later, I'll move chapters around, scenes around until they fit. Scrivener is perfect for that. It lets you keep different chunks uh, in what they call scrivenings, which are just individual little notes. You can move these all around, it's like I don't want this to be there, I want to drag it down and move it over here and make it a part of that. or I can rearrange everything as long as everything is in a little self-contained. So notes. those little postcard or the little card things. Yes. You, it's like is that just like pulling up a note and you just type that and then you rearrange them. You can use it that way, or I usually use this as sort of like a mm. a storyboard to see how things are going after the fact. Like put it into. A I will. I will typically, you know, I'll try to be in this mode where I'm writing and I will write out what I want to do and then expand it out and rearrange things. But if I need to see a big picture of how things are storyboarded out, that's mm -hmm. when I go to the view mm -hmm. of this. It's the same thing, it's just a different mm -hmm. view. It's just a different okay. view. Okay. Okay. Then there's a mode where you can like just get your like, type under mode. And just yes, everything. it's got a distraction-free writing environment, so if you just want to get in and write, you can do that too. Uh, Does it actually shut down like, your notifications on your machine? No, it no. probably does not do true <laughs> distraction. <laughs> it's full screen. Okay. There you go. Okay. So the other great thing about Scrivener is, is since you're inputting everything this way as notes, it has the ability to put a template on what, you're, what you've written so that everything looks consistent. All your headings look the same. Your fonts all the same. It all flows the same. Your indents are all the same. And then exports out to every format you, you could possibly want. That's a pretty good job of that. Yes. You could literally write in here, generate a, a Mobi file, upload it to Amazon, and be done. I wouldn't recommend that. You might want to look at it first. But you can do. Um, so, you could send it to your so, so do you yes. use all three of the ones that you're talking about? I use everything. And this so you use the Evernotes to dump your yes. dump, brain dump? Because, well, for one thing, because Scrivener is only available on like my machine. So unless I'm carrying my machine around with me, I can't just throw notes into this. Most of the time, i am got my phone, and I'm going to keep a note on this in Evernote. And then the stuff that's not junk goes into script. So then how do you, I know you guys are way more technical than I am, but how do you take it out from there and put it onto the computer? Okay, so let's talk about Evernote. I don't mind bouncing around. This is, this is good. I just need to get my, I've got two screens. This is weird. But so the, what I like about Ginkgo, to go back to it, is it's sort of like a web light version of Scrivener. Mm -hmm. If you look at Scrivener with its column of notes, and every note can have tags, metadata, uh, every, every scrivening of, of a scene can have its own notes and stuff spinning off of it. If you look at Ginkgo, you can use it exactly the same way. It just doesn't have all the bells and whistles. If you look at this as my book, here's my chapters, here's the notes I had about those chapters, and it just it can keep going on and on as I need to. And with Scrivener, if say this middle column is the actual text of my book, I can export just that column to Word, and it's done. And though, so you don't have to know about all the meta stuff around it. If everything's in that one column, it's done. It's exactly the same thing in Scrivener. Um, but I like this because everything's the same. So whether I use it for notes or pictures or metadata or just 
notes to remind me to do stuff, it's all in here. The only problem with that is it can then get a little chaotic. Maybe not everything's all in one column, and you've got to like make sure you restrain yourself to one column, but that's not hard. Um, the only other real problem, if I can call it a problem with Ginkgo, is it's still in beta. So it doesn't have every feature you might want. You can export to some features. It doesn't really have a backup. So what you want to do is export on a regular basis to something like a Dropbox. So if something does go wrong, because you don't control it, because it's in the web, right? It's not on your computer. It's up who knows where. If you couldn't get access to the website, you would have no information. So that is a downside. They're working on an offline version, though. And that's so one of the reasons no, why I support them. So there's no them. way to pull that down oh, you and see, make a copy onto your computer? I, you can. You can export this to many different formats. You can generate plain text. You can do a Word document. Okay. You can do the presentation like okay. I showed. And then this JSON, this is more for the geeky stuff, but this is what you would want to export for later re-importing if you needed to. So for your blogs, do you use... I do use this for my which blogs. Which one? <laughs> Well, I have All a lot three. of blogs, <laughs> but I have Morbid Meals, which is my cookbook blog. Okay. This tree right here is basically where I sort of come up with my different ideas for recipes. This is what I just did for Thanksgiving. This is yes, this is my Thanksgiving post. It hasn't posted yet, but it's about um, the horror stories that we all have at Thanksgiving, you know, when you got really uh -huh. sick and you threw up on everybody, Uncle Joe, <laughs> or you burned your stuffing. So I'm collecting those from people. Um, and some turkey tips, but my personal favorite uh, article is, uh, not the Cannonburgers, is, where is it? I've already moved it down because it's moved on. It is down here. So that's where you're talking about your middle column that you're using that. Right. Those are your posts. These, these are what will become my posts. Okay. And what's brilliant about this is I can copy this text here paste it right into WordPress and there's never a problem. If I go you don't in... don't have to even take it into to Notepad If you first. double click on it, you can edit it and that's where this is all uh, markdown text. You can paste that into WordPress if you've got a plugin that lets you use markdown, but I don't like to do that. I can take this web... There's one I wanted to show you. This is my Turducken for Thanksgiving post that I was writing about. Turkey Stein's... Turkey Stein's monstrosity. monstrosity. But it's a Turducken. <laughs> And so it's a recipe for how to make a turducken. What's a turducken? A turducken is when you take a chicken and you stuff it, you stuff it into a duck, stuff that, and you stuff it into a turkey, and you cook really? that, and it's oh. freaking delicious. I think, I think AJ said oh. for Yeah, for $7 a pound. Exactly. Oh, my God. It's dense. It's very dense. But since I'm also on a restricted diet, I have wow. recipes for the different types of stuffings that I can actually eat as well. Well, that would be interesting, <laughs> a vegetarian version. Uh, I'm sure you could use tofurkeys and oh, that would just be <laughs> toe chickens, toe ducks. I wouldn't eat that. <laughs> I, 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 did have, I, have this one. I have the opposite problem. I have to avoid gluten and, and other grains, so my turducken was stuffed basically with sausage. So it was really four meats. Uh, sausage uh, stuffing with the birds. That sounds great. Oh, it's oh, delicious. Sounds, sounds like it would be a good Brazilian thing. Yes. Well, if I could do it on a rotisserie, that would be really cool. Actually, you know what you do to avoid yes. that is you use... Um, uh, pork rinds stuffing. I made one one oh, year. Good work. Low carb, no. Uh, um, I'm going to write that down. Yeah, do. So I don't remember the recipe, this but I know that was the main. Instead of breadcrumbs, that's what I used. Pork rinds <laughs> stuffing. The one I've been wanting to have again is, uh, and unfortunately we don't live close enough to one to do this, but White Castle burger stuffing. <laughs> <laughs> that could be good. So I've got Evernote here. Let me bring that up just a minute. So basically, this has this has spell check and all that basic stuff. Well, okay. Ginkgo does not have spell check. No spell check. So let me explain. Only of these tools I've talked about so far, only Scrivener has spell check, grammar check, and all that kind of thing. This is Evernote. It has no spell check in it. It can highlight a few things. It has a dictionary, but I wouldn't even really call it a spell well, check. If you're using Ginkgo and Chrome, shouldn't it? That's what I was going to get to. So even though Ginkgo doesn't have spell check, your browser should. Really? So yes. Yeah, unless so, you're using Internet Explorer. Right. 
Internet Explorer. Chrome has a spell checker? Uh -huh. Yes. yes. Any, any text field in Chrome will, will spell to a bit of that under one. Is that, a, is that an extension thing? No, it's not. No, it's not Chrome. Really? Yeah. They use Chrome all the time. I didn't know that. You see, you yeah. see squiggles on your screen. Yeah. Yeah. If you have it in a spell. Yeah. Um, maybe it's the spell really well. Yeah. Never See, it's, it's not, but it, it should. Oh, I just accidentally clicked my so it's an automatic media thing center. That catches it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, it should do. I might actually have it turned off right now because it gets annoying after a while. But I turned it on when I need to edit things. Okay. So you have to turn it off and on. No, well, you'd have to you don't it's have on to. By it's on by oh, okay. Yes, it's on by default. I know you can turn it off. You can turn it off. <laughs> well, because since I'm since I'm either editing yeah. in Ginkgo or in WordPress, it's going to bitch at me all the time. But I like to go back and edit. If I'm typing and writing, the last thing I want to do is stop, correct something, go back. That's so, just me. That's just the way I work. So here's a quick question: like yes. in Scrivener, like let's say, so now you have like your, your character section. Yes. So let's say you put you create a character that has a weird name. Once you're writing your book part, will it still say it's misspelled? <laughs> I don't or does know. does it actually like build a, does it automatically? Like, yeah. You have to actually go through the trouble of linking your character notes to yeah. character tags and all of that, and yeah. I've never bothered with that either. Okay. I have used it for characters, for like my background information for a character. Okay. And I've got pictures in there, so that's the actress who I would see playing that <laughs> character. Uh, you know, this is basically a rap sheet or a, what do they call that, dossier on, on a character. Is that the and trick from True Blood? It is the trick from True Blood because I'm a vampire freak. That's baby vamp Jessica right there. Uh, so I've got these basically as notes about, you know, so that I don't say she's green eyes in one chapter and blue in another or something like that, just to keep myself straight. Uh, you can go through the trouble of linking this character to a tag that you can associate tags to scenes so you know which, who's in what scene. It's very good for storyboarding that way. Uh, that's not something I've gotten into, but it's there. And that's the, so that's the cool thing about Scrivener. It's got lots of tools that could really help you. You don't have to use them all. But if you're paying $40 for a program, you might want to try and play with it. Um, but there's a difference. It's one time Scrivener, $40. Ginkgo, $5 a month. Obviously, you do the math. If you use it for a long time, you're paying more than you would have for Scrivener. So it's all about where you want the value. I pay the $5 a month for Ginkgo because I know they're in beta. It's two guys, but they respond like that whenever I see something weird that doesn't quite work. They fix it immediately. It's a new feature. They have implemented things that I have suggested, like word counts, because that would be nice so that I don't have to export my document to Word just to do a freaking word count. So they've done that. I forget the option for it right now. Uh, but there's there's a way to uh, to do that, I think. No, that's not it, but it's in there. And it'll do it, right now it does it for the whole thing, but they're gonna make it so that you can do it for per note, per column, all that. So they're always working on it, and I love it. I, and I love the fact that I can, since it's on the web, I can use it on my phone. I can use it at the library, whatever I need to do to crank out story. But when I get inspiration for something or I'm capturing notes for something, I use Evernote for everything else. And so there's a lot of redundancy. I wish there was some way, an easy way, that I could merge these technologies. And there's like If This Then That and other website tools out there that if you make a post somewhere, it also shows up here. But I think that actually makes it more complex. I wish there was an easy way for me to dump stuff out of Evernote right into Ginkgo or right into Scrivener. So you can? Well, I can copy and paste individual stuff. Yeah. But I couldn't take, say, this this whole notebook on all my cookbook and recipes and stuff and just blurb that right into right, right. Ginkgo. Now, I could, for a long time, I did all my editing in Evernote, too. But anyone who's used Evernote for a very long time will tell you its editing tools are not exactly the best. But it's everywhere. You could do everything in Evernote. You could have all your notes in here. Uh, the only thing I really don't like about this is you can't move stuff around in individual notes. So let's say, let's say these were chapters in a book. I can't take this chapter and move it down here. It doesn't work that way. Like you can with Scrivener or you can with Inco where you can rearrange things. So 
if you wanted to write in Evernote, you might just take one note, just start writing, you could break it up later, move text around, you could still do it. But I, since I've discovered Ginkgo, I've just fallen in love with it. And cheap so and free. Favorite, right? That is my favorite right now. Yeah. Um, we heard about press books yesterday. Yes. Um, I don't know how many of you were in that conversation about self-publishing your book for $100 or less. I know yeah, Alexandra was. She talked about press books, and that looks really cool. It's like WordPress. It is. It is. Uh, somebody has taken cut WordPress. To, it'll cut to, uh, uh, you know, Mobi, Ease of, on the back end, PDF. It's PDF, cost a little extra. Uh, my press, keyboard. Right, so. See, as a writer, my keyboard is dying on me. I actually use another keyboard at home plugged into my computer. So Pressbooks is something that a company took WordPress as a baseline and they added stuff to it to make it possible for anyone to basically make a book online. You go in, you can make them public or private, write your book just like you would your blog, you can import into it. Um, and then when you're done, it's all free. When you export to PDF or uh, Mobi or EPUB, they watermark it. For $10, they'll take that off of the EPUB and the Mobi, but if you want them to take it off your PDF, it's $100. Oh. So, yeah. But that would be, when you've got it in your PDF, that's when you are ready to publish it in paper form, wherever those ended up. Right, so if you wanted to make a paperback book, that's when you'd want a PDF. So my question would be, when you export out of this, is it do you tell it the form factor? I haven't really yeah. played with this yet. You'd want to make sure it's the form factor for your book, and you would export that PDF. Okay. And then I could see that being worth a hundred dollars. But right, using this? No, we were both suggesting that this link might be helpful if she wanted to sell Right. And I believe they've got it so that you can take your books and you can sell them on here, but they'll also, you. the goal is for you to export them and sell so them on Smashwords. Not, so there's or, not a workaround to copy and paste that somewhere else into a, into a PDF, because you may not necessarily be done done to put well, it into a deep PDF. If you, you, if you were to use Pressbooks no. to create your book, which you can do it in chapters and, and do all the layout in it, right. If you paid the $10 to generate the EPUB, there are ways to turn that EPUB into a PDF. Okay. So you can do that, and then you could take that PDF and, and publish it. I don't want to say how to do that because I don't want the company to say, oh my god, you just lost us $100 a person. But it can yeah, but be done. Pretty, I mean, if they were, allowed you to export it to wherever it is that it's going, I could see. Right. But just to a PDF? Mm, not necessarily. Okay, so so I, we just heard about that yesterday. I haven't really had a chance to play with it, but it sounds like it's a really cool tool, right. especially if you're already used to blogging with WordPress. Right. It seems like it would be a perfect fit for Cause, an author. Because I take my blog at the end of every year, mm -hmm. and I, put, I dump it into Word, and, um, and then what she was talking about, you know, if, unless you're using the style sheets, because I don't use those. And it's really kind of... Well, but you would want to for this. So if once I, well, you, yeah, you could import, you could import your blog, or you'd have to export your blog from the WordPress, import it into Pressbooks, then apply their style sheet to it so it all looks the same, like a book, not like you cut and paste a bunch of blog posts together, right? So that's why they offer the themes, so that it's all consistent. Right. right. Then you output it with so that in, theme. So it's in a theme. Then. Yes. Okay. You can, and you can... I believe here it is appearance. All these different themes can be applied to your text, so it all has the same kind of headers, right, formatting. Right, right, right. Scrivener does exactly the same thing. In fact, in many ways, this is like the blog Scrivener union that many people are probably looking for. Yeah. Okay. If you like working in pieces and want to theme everything when you're done, but you're used to blogging with WordPress. The thing about it is when you when you convert your blog to a book, it's like the book writes itself. Right, but this helps you make it look right, like a right, book. Right, 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 exactly. Um, 
So I, I love the fact that this exists. I was actually toying with doing something very similar to right. this myself uh, with my uh, cookbook blogs. I had gotten to the point where, yes, I used Ginkgo to sort of come up with ideas and, and such, but I would actually go into WordPress, make those posts, but keep them as drafts and work on them there. And that way I could still also use the WordPress app on my phone. I could edit the recipes until I got them just right publish when I was done. Um, so press book seems like very much the next step to that. Just write your book in a blog. I have a question. Yes. Do you know of a, some kind of type of a, you know, um, app of whatever for putting together either like a dictionary or a glossary of terms? I mean, how do you do that in a book? Well, if you do it in Word, you can mark everything as a footnote, for example, or I think as a terminology. Uh, what but does I think that call it. make it be? So uh, then, when you're done, yeah. Well, so then, when you're done, which you've highlighted all those things as specific terms, mm -hmm. you can have a page that's generated that is a, an appendix or a glossary or however uh -huh. you want to look at it's it. It's called footnote. Yeah. Well, that's one way of doing it. I'm okay. sure my version of Word that I use on my computer is the cheap version that doesn't have all the features. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I've used I'm still it. I'm using 2010, I think. But I'm sure there has to be a way to do that in yeah, Word. Table of contents, index, yeah. All that stuff is built, built in Word. You just have to go through the trouble of highlighting those types of things and saving them as. That's. But the way I do it now is more like the way that Scrivener works. With I use index cards. Yeah. Um, but then I have to put it into a computer. Well, so point. yeah, there's no reason why you couldn't do that with Scrivener, where you could keep notes as you're going and then compile them all together. Right, right, at some point. I actually have like a little database program that I use, but it's like you do the word and then the definition. Right. It's okay, but uh, I just thought maybe you might know something else that was... No, I could find out though. Um, you know, cause it, it, huh? What did I have to I could do that. Okay. The problem is which one? Do we want to talk about that, or is there any other questions? And this is not just about me blabbing. If you guys have something you want to share, come on up, right? Unconference away. So these are the three tools. No, no uh, more tools? I use a bazillion tools. Okay, so talk about some more. Have you ever really checked out LeanPub? I have checked out. I have published with LeanPub. Oh, have you? What yes, I have. Um, I like the fact, so for those who don't know, LeanPub is basically an online publisher. You go onto their website, you import your masterpiece, and they'll sell it online for you. But what's cool about LeanPub is you can do more than just your book. You can attach other stuff to it. So as a podcaster, I have created podcasts of two of my works, and I can and did with one of them have my book online for sale through LeanPub. You can download the EPUB book and read it. But if you pay $5 more, you can get the package version that has my EPUB of my book and the audio zip file of all of my MP3s. So you can listen to it if you want. LeanPub makes that possible. You can package stuff together. Okay. So it, it could be used for that. It could be for anybody who wants to do that marketing technique of, and if you pay $1 more, you get this 40 ways to spend all your money. And you can attach that and have it be package deals. They have a cool thing too where you can, you don't have to have a hard price for your book. You can put also true, that was the other thing. Recommended price is that maybe with whatever you feel. Right, you know. that's yeah. another very, I, I forgot about I that. I don't know how useful, I don't know, some people might think that's useful. Well, and I'm a cheap bastard. I'll say it, I like selling my stuff cheap. People want to pay more, they can, and that like Lean Pub makes that possible. <laughs> and, and, okay, so let me ask you this: Do you find that people do with Lean Pub? Mm -hmm. Well, of all the places, and I'm going to probably no, repeat. No, in general, not Lean Pub. Just well, in I'm, general, if you do like, oh, pay me more or donate to this. Do I'm know? I'm an odd duck, so I don't like paper books for many different reasons. One of them is I have a dust allergy, which sucks for somebody who loves books, okay? I used to have bookshelves all over the place. Now I have one and it's all reference materials that I am painstakingly having scanned so that I don't have to have 
bookshelves anymore because of the temptation to grab a book and suffer while I'm reading. But uh, so I'm all about ebook readers, phone reader apps, and stuff. So I still make paper books because I know people still like reading them. But they are, I sell them for as cheap as I can because I think $749, which is the cheapest my novel sells for, is outrageous. I would like to see my book sell for $4, $5 at the most, even as a paperback book. That's just me. I don't think you should spend $10 for a novel. I'm so crazy. Yesterday's, whose text was they said the Smashwords had the optimum price? $3.99. But it makes sense. That's what, a large coffee right. at Starbucks? Like, yeah, so since I had to do the... Yeah, you're like, right. the button. Like, With the print-on-demand stuff, there's a base you have to charge because they take their cut when they print everything out and do all of their stuff. So with those paperbacks that are floating around, those are all at the cheapest I can sell them, except for Fresh Blood, which okay. the profits go to a charity. Okay. Well, so the, but those books are... Um, but for e-books... You, you read them and pass them on. Right. It's not like a reference book. Also true. So for e-books, my novel sells for 99 cents. That little tiny thing. Sells for 99 cents as an e-book. The... Fresh Blood Anthology sells for, I think, in some places four ninety nine, some places nine ninety nine. But wherever it's really expensive, we usually have discount codes. But that one specifically was created to raise money for a charity. What was it? Amazon like it has to be two ninety nine and nine ninety nine. If you want to have decent royalties, otherwise yes. Otherwise, they take they flip to right. the wrong money. Right. So it has to be two ninety nine to nine ninety nine if you want to get the highest percentage to take. But I'm the kind of person who just wants stuff to go out there. I write software for a living. It's a comfortable living. It's not a great living, but it's a comfortable living. I know I'm never going to make money as a writer. That's just my mindset. I'd love to write the great American novel that becomes a movie and I get filthy rich, but that's never going to happen until I have the time to sit down and write the great American novel. And that's what I focus more time on is finding the tools that help me write better. When I'm done with it, then I sell it for a decent price. I think two ninety nine, three ninety nine for a novel is about right. If it's a textbook, okay, it let, should let, be let more. Me, let me ask you a question. A little off script there. Yes. So if I were to hire you, you wouldn't want to do that. If I were to hire you <laughs> as a programmer. Yeah, as a programmer, I would charge you fifty dollars an hour. Okay, but for your hobby stuff, yes. you want to give it away. Yes, that's what okay. I like to do. And that. That concept or that, that model right. is what devalues the market to Why? me, from my perspective. Yeah, but that's the 21st century. Well, how much would you that's sell dinosaur city. porn for? I mean, <laughs> really. For offshoring and outsourcing. It, the marketplace has opened up to the point where anybody can publish anything. Yeah. So I'd rather sell my novel for 99 cents, hoping someone will go, yeah, I'll give that a try. And, and, as a and writer, I'm entertained. And as a writer, ultimately, it's like how many people, how many, how many people in the hands you place the word right. that you want to speak. You know? And I do sell more copies on Amazon, but I also publish through Smashwords, which gets me in all the other places. Smashwords and Amazon have a weird relationship, but I think Amazon and everybody else have a weird relationship. Just ask Hatchet or Hachette, right? Yeah. So, hey, yeah. They're yeah, still, I they still, they still, they did bury the hatchet. <laughs> <laughs> they did just. And so I was able to get Gil Carriger's recent book too, thanks because of that. But um, I sell things as cheap as possible. And for other things like fresh blood, when I do make money, I donate it. That's just the way I am. That's just me. I think other people could use that money for something else. But if you want to be entertained for a buck, that's what well, I'm I've, I've heard, the, I heard there are, there are uh, music authors and uh, musical performers who will do the same kind of thing where in order to generate mind share or generate interest, they'll get their they get the music out in the, as quickly right. as possible right. and then try and build an audience. Well, that's because historically, you know, musicians don't make the money off the music sales. They make the money off of concerts exactly. right. and, the, and the things they sell at concerts like t-shirts and all that. That's, that's, that's where they make the best. And what Most authors hearing? that make it off books, yeah, they make it off the touring. Hearing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I was sitting next to what was his name, Sean, 
that went to a KISS conference or something like that, a KISS yeah, yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. And the they, cruise. And they were selling meet and greets plus signed guitars, and oh, yeah. so they make That's money they in like band. huge yeah. ways. Yeah. Well, you know? Kiss is the ultimate band as far as marketing and they right, right. That's what he was, money off that's of their bands. Saying. Kiss is the Kiss. 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 the dead, I mean, dead, deadheads, they, they have cuts on uh, every yeah. single concert. I have a Jerry Garcia tie. <laughs> yeah. and, and they're out there, you know, and the, the band encourages people to, to record them and then they, they, they publish them online and everyone shares and it's like, oh, I want to hear Kansas City, 1975. Okay, sure, and and uh, and it's just out there, and they make their money off of touring and, and off of uh, appearances. It's just a different model. Hack side, mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. But but I mean, but you know, even I would even say though that the debt is a little bit more of a niche market than sure. than Kiss is. Kiss wants to sell every single music fan in the world, and they want to make as much money off of them as possible. Gene Simmons has even said that in interviews to where it is. But ironically, they don't have a Ben and Jerry's ice cream. <laughs> Jerry Garcia does. So yeah. They have fish food, too. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm not saying one is cooler than the other. I'm, I'm just saying... That. I think Ben and Jerry's ice cream makes them cooler than Kiss. That's just my opinion. <laughs> well, Kiss needs to have a blood flavor. I mean, Colbert is better as well. <laughs> Damn right. Americone Dream. Stephen <laughs> Colbert has no ice cream. Yeah. Does it, actually, I think they discontinued oh, the they did they? American Dream. I don't know, maybe. Maybe it was big during the, uh, the yeah, election they, season. It was a temporary flavor. They, they have, they have a, a graveyard. A grave site at, at Ben and Jerry's in Vermont where you can see the, the flavors that have been, been yes. tired and, and, and buried. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. It's all about me, people. Yeah, yeah. Pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, where are we at? So we were talking about lean pub. <laughs> so this is this is my lean pub page right here for Black Magic, which is one that I don't have the paperback for. It's just an ebook, but it was the one that I just did a full cast audio production with. It was produced mm. for HorrorAddicts.net as a podcast. So it was a serialized fiction during their run of their podcast, and then I. Took that audio and I bundled it up. So the cool thing about Lean Pub is you can buy the ebook. The suggested price is ninety nine cents for that, but you can pay more if you want. That's the cool thing about Lean Pub is if you think, hey, it's worth it, you can you change this slider. But the other cool thing about and it. And my question is, do they pay more? I have not had any sold sales from this site yet, okay. so I can't answer that okay. question. But Honest when I do, I will probably mention and blog about that. Okay. But so here the cool thing is with the full cast audio, the suggestion price goes up to four ninety nine because people will pay more for audio, especially if it sounds good. They will. Mm. You could buy a $5 book or you can buy a $30 CD set of the audio. Have you ever noticed that? It's ridiculous in my opinion, but people will pay more for the ability to just plug in and disconnect and listen while they're driving, mowing their lawn, working out, all that. But again, this is a suggested price. You could dial that back if you want to. But the other cool thing about Lean Pub is also with this, they build in donations. So let's say you want to you want to pay for this. You can change this scale, but it tells you where is it that part of the proceeds go to a charity. Yeah, right. Third Do you bar see it? From the yeah, that, yeah, under the cause gets. There you go. So I. 80% of the money that I'm charging you goes to the Electronic Frontier Foundation. So I'm not, even though I'm charging $5 for that, I'm seeing a buck. And it's a part of a buck because they take their piece of it. But it is cool. You can take this slider, you say, I want to pay this much money or I want to pay 99 cents. It's the humble bundle model. It's really cool. So Lean Pub is probably my favorite publisher right now, but it's just on this site. So that's the only place you can for this, yes. Yeah. So if you want if you want this to be your market and you like the sliding and the donations and bundling, you have to tell everyone come to this page. Um, Which but, means you're gonna like get ten percent of the sales you right. Get. So you still need to be on Amazon. You should still be in Smashwords because they put you <coughs> in the Nook and Sony and everything. But what's cool about Smashwords is you can set up coupon codes. So I can say, you know, I can do a, a bundle. Like since I write mostly vampire and horror stuff, 
Halloween is when I throw out coupon codes. That's when I want everyone to come check me out and talk about this stuff, especially Fresh Blood. A lot more interest for that around Halloween. So if you do that, do you also have to reduce the price on Amazon? Because doesn't Amazon do like weird things? It like will do it automatically, I have okay. discovered. Okay. <laughs> to my chagrin, yeah. I suppose. Uh, no, they do that automatically. I, they, they do say in the contract you have to, Amazon has to be the cheapest. But they'll do it for you. <laughs> and maybe when you don't want to, and they'll put you on sale without now, telling is you. Is that because, are they, are they like... Evil they, overlords? I mean, I mean, do they just like, like, <laughs> they like control the web and like look for where else the book is selling and just like set up like... I'm sure they have minions. Controller? I'm sure they have minions who troll the web. Or they, someone, have, they have their own back end. Well, I just wonder, is it, a, is it a crawler or is it... I a, have no idea. But I have or also it, noticed. Like someone, it's like, it's like, I know, like, because I'm on slip deals a lot. Well, I used to be. I stopped doing it because I spent too much money. <laughs> but uh, I know that, like, Amazon will do price matching, but usually someone submits it to Amazon in order to get the price match. So I'm wondering, does, is someone actually submitting your book to Maybe. price match? Maybe. I don't I Really? Do there's a price match on I'm a seller on Amazon. I didn't know that. They will, it depends. Like, like Amazon will. It, it seems to vary of whether or not they'll do a price match, but a lot of times if you submit, like if Best Buy is selling a product for a certain price and someone submits it to Amazon, like there's a 50-50 chance that Amazon will drop their price to match that. Really? I wouldn't be surprised. Um, well, I do know that they do have a back-end thing that they work with in terms of like their pricing model. The sellers on Amazon right. are using computerized yeah. price. I mean, that's why this comment that I was making about, you know, when you go to the cheapest at the values, that's where you get like dollar books on Amazon. As a seller on Amazon, you don't want a dollar book because you don't make any money. True. Yeah, because Amazon takes 70% at that point, right? No, I'm no. talking about, well, I, yeah. I, I sell used books. Okay. okay I'm not publishing okay. new like okay. this. I'm just saying that in that field, what used to be, you know, when you'd go to the bookstore, you can now sell used books. Anybody can open up a free account and sell you yes. know, the books you want to I've read. done that too. And I've been, I've been trying to sell a lot of my books so I don't have to. years worth of books in my own library. Mm -hmm. How's um, that working? Fine, fine. It works good, except you have to really be kind of stringent about paying attention to feedback and stuff because people don't really leave feedback on Amazon and the ones that do it. It's, it's negative. negative. Unless it's negative. <laughs> and you can get. Do you like make a lot of trips to the post office? Yeah, yeah, but well, Amazon will let you print postage. Yes, yes, yes. But yes. you still have to. You can. Well, yeah, but I do once. I mean, I'm not. When I first started out a couple of years ago, um, I was just getting at the level of going professional where I'd be paying for it, and then I got a negative feedback, and it basically scaled me back down. And I found out that the platform that I was on did not easily scale to the new one that they were promoting. It pissed me off because. I had like 300 listings, which takes a lot of computer stuff. And contrary yeah. to being, I don't like sitting in front of a computer. Uh, so well, it's tedious. <laughs> it's we'll tedious. work for computer time. It's, yeah. it's tedious, you it's know. Tedious so, that are so, so anyway, all I'm saying is that it's a good way to turn over. If you're a book lover, know, you buy books. books. It, yeah, set it up and then just pass them back out again. Well, I but, normally will take stuff to half price books first and then the stuff that they don't want. I'll try to sell on Amazon and I'm surprised at how many people will buy stuff from me on Amazon when the local bookstore didn't even want well, it. Well, stuff goes out of print stuff, you know. Like, oh, you know I, have, I, mean, I, have, really a, I have a little book. niche market. My niche bar market is like UFO stuff. Right. The ones that the conspiracy government... Dude, I read about vampires. Stuff. What are you laughing? <laughs> yeah, all right. That's the only reason why he and I talk, because he, he's into vampires. I'm into aliens, you know? <laughs> what about aliens? Now that's a story. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, as a niche market on selling books... Actually, they did that. It was called Dracula 3000, and it was the worst movie ever. <laughs> vampires in space. That would suck. It would. <laughs> Green Just blood. Making, <laughs> no, just write a book about it. Don't make a movie out of it. Because oh, yeah. it'll just look good around. But making a story out of it, you're good. I like the way you think. But anyway, going back to the pricing thing. Yes. Is that all of the sellers. I'm the wrong person to talk to. Price, because I don't even look at my stats. They, they do just the software and they they fluctuate. Yes. Of like yes, what they do. Are paying. Yes. Now, I don't do that because I'm not big enough to have that software and do that. But what happens is they get into these bidding 
and then they drive the price down to a yes, dollar. They do. And then there's no money in it anymore. Right. And that's like kills that deal. Right. And the only ones that make money on it are the, Amazon. Big, are the big volume people. Well, yeah. Because yeah. they're like selling it. Or the ones that are doing fulfillment by Amazon where you ship the books to Amazon and then sell them out the other way. So this is like if you're publishing and then they have the other end of selling books that are used from somebody else. I have also noticed that if I were to set up something where I gave books away for free on a site, Amazon will charge zero dollars as well. I've seen them do that. Um, yep. They keep track away. of it through that AISN number. That's probably. Maybe. I don't Maybe know. Maybe that's how. Every one of these that I've published has a different ISBN number if, if they ask for it and it's cheap. Well, I'll I get did one. read an article once that said there's, there are some outlets that are bought in the thing, like they, they look at the sales and they algorithmically. Well, I'm sure that's Amazon that's does. That's why sometimes you go and see a book and it's like, it's $123. Right. It's like, well, because it's not a human set that price. They're like looking at prices like, like, and then yeah, and so they keep bumping it down just one like lower right, than right, the, right, the right, previous right. guy. And it's all automated, so it's like it's right, like it's big right, exactly. Like, exactly. We don't care. Some some fool out there is going to buy it because he wants it. You know. I I sold the book for eight hundred dollars on Amazon. Oh wow. That I bought for forty dollars oh, ten years prior. <laughs> is it like a first run or something? It was. <laughs> It was this guy that wrote a book about conspiracy, underground, uh, yeah, underground theories, and the, the those places underground that the government controls. Okay. okay. I had a and teacher in high school explain that. Okay. So anyway, I bought this book, and this guy was a Christian minister, and uh, and he used to do deprogramming right. alien people. Right. Anyway, so I bought the book as a reference book, but the thing was like so gross. <laughs> I mean, really spooky Where did stuff. you get those pictures from? Really spooky stuff. But it sat on my shelf for 10 years. Then one day I started selling stuff on Amazon. I listed it to see if there was anybody there. There was a two-volume version of it for $2,000. And I thought, what? I didn't even, first of all, I didn't realize there was a second volume that I didn't know. But Scandalous. I thought, anyway, so I put mine on for 800 bucks. Yeah. And within, it didn't sell like right away. It was like two months and finally somebody bought it. But there was a lot of negative feedback. Why are you selling that book for so much? I didn't sell the $2,000 one. I sold mine for eight, so I did bring it down. But that was a $40 investment that paid off. Nice. You know, it got it out of my house and in but my pocket. Wait a minute, they're giving you feedback on why is it so much, but they didn't buy the book? <laughs> right. No, no, no scene, yes, right? no, this, this was, book, yeah. this, the feedback was on the, the, the two book volume. For somebody else had because you know oh. you multiple people can sell the same book. Yes. Oh, okay. okay, they're not the author, they're just selling the used book. So I was only competing against that other two book volume and mine was the only other one. So when I sold mine there was nothing available. But I did some research to find out why it was so expensive. And apparently the guy Aliens. The guy, <laughs> huh? Aliens. <laughs> no, what happened? Yeah. Apparently, apparently he was being persecuted by the government. The government that always him. drives the price up. Yes, what? framed him for uh, bank robbery. Oh, great! And so That's he went out. He was a self-publisher, so well, he had a limited he, run. <laughs> no, Bantam ain't touching that book. <laughs> well, at least that's what they want you to believe. That's so, right. All I know is that the guy's in jail for you know bank robbery, and he was he was a minister. You know, I mean, well, that could never happen. <laughs> so there must have been like some kind of excommunication with this guy or something. Something After happened in prison. Aliens. Yeah, yeah something. Aliens know, set him up. All I know is that. For a fall. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or I think, anyway, he was, it was, oh, I think he must have been possessed at the time. We yes. don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he was abducted. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> anyway, he was, not he, was. he was not publishing anymore. So the book went up in value. All right. So, Any other questions? So if, if you if you Websites need to be abducted we someday, yeah. I probably have been abducted and, and, and have had my mind wiped. <laughs> the book prices will actually Skyrock. go higher. Yes. You'll know I've been turned into an alien when I start selling my stuff for more than a dollar. <laughs> right. exactly. Then just reach out and say, Dan, we know there's a problem. <laughs> You've been possessed by marketing and aliens. <laughs> It's now two ninety nine. You bastards! You bastards! You. <laughs> <laughs> so 
Are there any other questions, topics, conversation, writing stuff? Yeah, somebody else got any more tools for us? Anybody else using something? Notepad? Yeah, I, I use notepad. notepad. You, know, you mentioned, yeah. mentioned Amazon doing the whole price matching if you're trying to give away a book away for free. Yeah. Is there ways around that? Like if you put the way I do that is I mark everything like around a dollar ninety nine or ninety nine cents somewhere, and then Amazon levels that. But then I'll go to Smashwords and I'll set up a coupon code and tell everyone the coupon code that gets it to you for free. Okay. But then I do feel bad for the people who still go to Amazon and pay a dollar for it. I wish there was a way I could go to Amazon and set up coupon codes as well. But I don't want to go to Amazon and say I want you to give my book away for free yeah, because yeah. that sends the wrong impression. It should sell for something. But then you find a way to encourage people to try a taste or something like that. But back in the day, I actually wrote software to put books up online when people thought it was crazy. And uh, nobody wanted to do that because why would you want to read a book online or on a phone or on a what is this tablet thing? Nobody wanted to do that. It's going to hurt my eyes to read the book on the computer screen. Now everyone's doing it. But isn't it supposed to be like a new generation where like um, the... No, it's just the newest toy. Yeah, pretty much. I like it because then I don't. I can carry hundreds of books on this teeny tiny thin thing that stays with me all the time. Right. That's why I like ebooks. But I think you for books on your phone? I do. Well, especially on this one because this is it's nice. nice. It's big. Size. It's clear. It's crisp. But I don't. I don't even like reading books on my iPad. I don't. I, 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 uh, again, I'm weird. But I also have trifocals. Thank you very much. So. Kindle But it's. Not tri but I think it's one of those. I think when it comes to having new technology in general, we're looking at um, different theories and different ideas to be more environmental and stuff. Instead yes, of being less, except instead for people of who don't so care. Much paper, yes. We're trying to be more electronic about it. And I know lots of people more. who are very green. They don't like to print things out. When they're at their work, they're behind all those initiatives to stop printing things out. But they still want that paperback book that they can kick back with right. on the subway. It's a, it's a keen aesthetic thing. I, y yes, and it's a, I understand why people are like that, but I'm still like, hmm. first off, I don't want you seeing what I'm reading. You see in the cover of my book, I'm going to sit here and read Dragon Smut. I don't know, but it, <laughs> it can be anything. Uh, and people will just think that like you're doing something personal. Oh, look at him. He's texting, like, being antisocial. Ha, ha, ha. And, and when they kind of accidentally sneak over there, they actually think I, you're reading How can word. you read that, man? Yeah, pretty much. It's tiny. And look at all those dirty words. <laughs> if I can't read vampire smut on the subway, the terrorists will have already... That's right. Thanks, Obama. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> When only criminals can read vampire <laughs> smut. <laughs> <laughs> when you outlaw vampire smut, only criminals will read vampire smut. That's right. Can we form an NRA for vampire smut? That would be awesome. Second Amendment, First Amendment right, really, you know? Somebody's tuning in to Ustream right now thinking, holy shit, they're drunk. And it's 1042 in the morning. It's Game of Thrones, I mean. <laughs> so, Are there uh, any other questions related to writing that doesn't involve vampire smuts? <laughs> 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 it does. Why has nobody tweeted that yet? Anybody remember overheard? Just overheard. I still do that. Basically, it'll make that. I remember when we used to treat everything. <laughs> remember when you had to read tea? Oh, there we go. I remember when that wasn't a thing built into the application. Yes. Or hashtags. Or hashtags. Or hashtags. Or hashtags. Or hashtags. Or hashtags. And now people are getting pissed about the hashtags and the ads because of Twitter and all these other things. They need to grow up. It's either here to stay or it's not. Right. However, right. you know, if your Twitter post is more hashtags, yeah. Right? <laughs> hashtag, we get this really long hashtag. Lol. So talk about some blogging stuff. Well, I love WordPress. 
let's talk about what we were talking about yesterday, the ability to have more than one blog on yes, your WordPress. That would be a good one. Does anybody else do that or am I also weird in that respect where I use WordPress to host like a dozen different blogs? <laughs> You can do it on Tumblr. I don't use WordPress. I am supposed to say, but I, I have used blogging sites to, to host multiple blogs. You've got like a thousand blogs on Tumblr. I'm close to saying both, but I've never done any blogs. Did you misspell your own name? It's this keyboard. Seriously, oh. I have another keyboard at home <laughs> that I use because I have used this one so much the keys are just messed up. So, so do, you, wow. uh, do you have uh, WordPress hosted or do you use the I use I use GoDaddy. And I have WordPress.org installed on my, on my... But what we were talking about is how to do um, multiple blogs controlling it through one dashboard. Right. Apparently the new 2014... Well, actually it's been around for a while. I don't know when this started, but yeah. they have this ability. It was called something different now. Now it's just called My Sites, where you can have multiple right. blogs. It has to be on the same post. Okay, so maybe that's the issue. Uh, yeah, they're all they're all on my host. These are right. all just right. Well, if you go to if you go to WordPress.com, you can do the same thing, and you set up a. Uh, yeah, but you have to pay oh, yeah. more for that, right? You don't use no. Well, I'm using it for. I have some people that are doing fan blogs for my work, and it's a simple thing for them to get started because they don't know nothing about. Them. Right. But then I'm eventually wanting to transfer them over to doing a multiple blog. That's, is that up there at the top there? Yeah, Dan? so my sites. So okay. um, I also use what they call domain mapping. So that I have, I am a domain hoarder. I love GoDaddy. They are an enabler for cheap domains. And when I come up with something cool, the first thing I do is I buy the domain for it. And then I go, can I blog about that? And then I usually do. And then it doesn't last long I'm, and I I'm kill it. I'm a reseller. For, I didn't call myself a hoarder, but I'm a reseller. Well, I don't resell them. I keep them. them. I'm a hoarder. <laughs> yeah, I guess I am too then. <laughs> uh, I would rather be more of a reseller, but I want to be so sure about what? Sure about what? Because um, I'm just, I'm a little bit more of the personal business side. Right. Not, because I haven't even gotten into like the actual business itself, because I'm doing more photography in general. Right. And considering that I'm actually doing it personal for now. Right. I'm trying to find ways to make it more like actual business and such. So well, the first thing you need to do is put up a portfolio. Have you done that yet? Right. The pictures? I, I'm just trying to find the right time to do it. I'm okay. Trying well, to find the right time. Because like, I'm still going through like school and such. And well, of course. But so if you've got a blog, you put your pictures up there, have a page that's your portfolio with all the fancy you know, transitions and whatever. And that is what you tell people. Look, you want you want me to be your photographer? Here's my web page with stuff I've done. Look for an online photography website that will allow you to post your pictures to do what he's talking about. Because years ago, when I told you I was doing wedding ministry, um, this was before anybody was doing it. Um, this young guy was a young photographer. He was just starting out. He bought himself a camera, taught himself everything, and he wanted to be a wedding photographer. Right. Well, back then they were like charging two thousand dollars. So most people to be a photographer to take pictures of no, a wedding. Two thousand dollars for general. a package for a wedding photography. I am totally in the wrong business. Yes, I know. Because like, and, but so anyway, he was he was wanting to charge like what the experienced guys were charging. Like, first of all, I'm thinking, first yeah. of all, you don't have enough experience to be charging that. Can you group all together so I can take a picture of you at the wedding? Right. So so basically, though, what I told him was, is, look, I said, why don't you? I found this website for him that allowed him to upload, and then people then order the, the pictures yes. offline. Sure. And that's like standard now, right? Yes. But this was like when it was brand new, nobody was doing it. And so he charged by the hour to go out and do his thing. He uploaded the pictures and then let people buy it, and it was way cheaper. I mean, but that was the standard package, was $2,000 for a <laughs> professional wedding package. That sounded painful. Is there any, <laughs> any crazier what's been going on in here? So, yeah, so, but that's what you need, is a website like that, and then get yourself a little business yeah. card, and... Yeah, I've got like, I mean, because I've got like a... Maybe you're in business, give me one. I have a dedicated, I've got like a bunch of different pieces of moo cards. Moo cards. Moo cards. Yeah, moo cards, I love moo cards. No? No. But, um... Like that's what I have for like, like personal reasons. Well, 
you know, and, and they're decent ones. They're not the free ones with their ad on the back, but uh, the yeah, cheap. I think we're unconferencing now. Does anybody have any other questions? I mean, you guys can keep talking in groups. That, that's cool. But if anybody does have any other questions, I'm I don't sorry. want to. I, we were talking. We were talking about this, blog. The, the blog, and yeah. then I kind of interrupted. No, you. it's okay, because it's an unconference. It's cool. I'm not trying to stop that. But <laughs> if while I'm up here, if anybody has any other questions, otherwise so we can, can let we somebody else. So can we go back else? to what you were talking about with the WordPress? Okay. Well, so this is one of my blogs. Okay. Let and free gluten. I was gonna say, and then after that, Jody, do you want to do some stuff about? Uh, the accounting, accounting tools, and yeah, okay, sort of, sort of direct. Okay, so. okay, cool. Okay, so show us some of your blogs, though. Okay, how you're, how you're using it now. So, since I have two fetishes when it comes to food, one is the food I can eat and the food I can't. Really, kind of uh, gluten-free gluttony is for the the recipes that I can eat, and I share them, and I'm going to put them all together in a cookbook. And I am using. WordPress not only as a place to share off some of the recipes, but save recipes that I'm not going to publish until they're in a cookbook, and I'm keeping them separated with tags and all that you know categories that they're in. So they, I can write them in WordPress in one place, post the ones I want, especially when they're timely, like the Thanksgiving ones and stuff. Uh, but the others I keep, and then when I've got enough of those, I'm going to export them out of WordPress, put them into Scrivener pretty them up, publish it. Why don't you keep them in Scrivener rather than, I mean, if you don't want to publish Because well, it's two places either way you do it. I could work it all in Scrivener, but then I got to copy a post and post it. Okay. Or I could keep them all here where it's actually a lot more and categorizable, just, right? And, uh, you know, everything relates to each other. I've got links to all the different recipes. So do you just unpublish it in WordPress? Is that what, how you do you it? Can, well, first, Everything can be in a draft state if you okay. want, but you can also okay. unpublish or okay. protect them. I mean, you can password protect posts, but I've right. never done that. I've never done it either. I never thought about storing things that I didn't want to post yet in WordPress unpublished. Right, and you can also, if you're, if you're one of those people who likes to write stuff ahead of time and then right. regularly schedule say, things, WordPress lets you do that. You just put in a date when you want yeah. that to post, and it is not published until that date hits, okay. and then it posts for you And does it automatically? Yes, it does. No. And it, they now have the ability to tweet for you when those things get posted. So go back up to the, um, the My Sites. Yes. So, okay, so that's your various blogs. That's actually not even all of them. I think it only shows you a certain and number of do them. You, are all of those <laughs> active? I mean, do you actively keep up on them? Consistency! Consistency! Can no, I don't. Okay. Because I have a 9 to 5 job, so I do post whenever I get around to it, because I'm not a professional blogger. Okay. So again, I'm not the poster child for this, but I do. That's another reason why I have a bunch of different blogs, because I don't have one, although I do have a danshret.com, that's more for stuff I'm writing or my what I would put on Facebook or tweet about. And so when you do that blog, yes. again, since you do it part time and you do it as a hobby, you're yes. not optimizing those for. No, I couldn't give a rat's ass about that. SEO. Okay, I was going to ask you about SEO. So but, you don't really do much of that. But gluten free food apparently is very popular, and I've actually gotten quite a lot of traffic. So SEO is a pain in the ass, but I'll tell you the one thing that I've learned that helps a lot is that Google puts a lot of value on the title of your page. Yeah. So when you're setting the title of your page, just put all your keywords up there. So like, you know, if, if you have a blog about, you know, again, if it's a blog about vampires, then, you know, you probably want to call the title space Dan Charette's blog about awesome vampires. <laughs> and you know, that was taken. I had to go for out of the coffin. No. <laughs> But that title you just said right there is was understandable by a human. It wasn't oh, keyword yeah. stuffed. No, no. But, well, you know, well, it was vampires. Know, Dan Charette. Dan, 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 Dan is in there. is in there. Vampires. Yeah, yeah. And when I when I do mine, I have my. You can even put in Phoenix, Arizona, yeah. if he wants to. Yeah. So it's like yeah, that you'll put the keywords in you know as much stuff as. as, as, as I just finished my first WordPress start to finish. I had been blogging for a lot of years, but I didn't set it up initially. And I just finished my first one, and I started using that Yoast 
which forces you to think how they want you to. Okay. And uh, I had it tells you when you're not doing it right. And it took me a while to figure out. Does it scold you? Well, no, it would say, okay, you're using this many free, uh, you know, keywords, and we really would like you to use this many. And, oh, you're not putting enough content on that page. Because I use a lot where I, uh, I use a lot of, like, doorway pages. Yeah. I link back to my other websites, and they're kind of all interlinked and stuff. And um, so when I started using Yoast, I was, like, realizing that, you know, maybe I wasn't doing things the right way. Well, you can look at it that way, or you can just take that advice yeah, that was, and apply what you need right, to. Right, right. So Don't let good. any tool tell you the right way to do something. Right, right. Ever. Especially if it puts little squiggles underneath the word, and you know you spelled it right. <laughs> That's the way I spell it. That's Add it to dictionary. <laughs> and it's done. I probably that too. Right. right. So, so you're this, you're one that's with your name, Dan Shura. Yes. And and what do you talk about on that blog? Well, this one's depressing. This is when P.G. Holyfield passed away. But there's a picture of me with Evo. Mm -hmm. That's happy. This unfortunately is uh, P.G. Holyfield who passed away. He was a writer. He had cancer. Completely screwed him over in two weeks. Whoa. Completely wow. ravaged his body. Wow. Yeah. Uh, the name of the carcinoma. Where is it? It's depressing. Colin, I can't even pronounce it. It's this where, word right there. Where does that kind of cancer? What, what it started in his blood. Oh wow! And to his whole body. He he went from diagnosis to we heard about it two weeks later. He had passed. Wow! And that sounds like cancer sucks, but he was really awesome. So cancer, fuck cancer. I'll end on that note. Fuck yeah. cancer. Right. Fuck cancer. All right. If you guys have any other questions, um, Twitter, DanS42. Probably the easiest way to reach out to me from there. I'm on Facebook, wherever else. But Google, if you can remember how to spell my name, Dan Charette, I'm all over the place on Google. And there's my cue. Thank you very much for listening to me. I did not. I can say uh, I worked. Yeah. Should have, we? If you have, to, it's your call. I, I don't if care. If you type it on the screen, you can't really read what's on the screen. So. I work for Pegasus Solutions. Really? We write software for the hotel industry. Yeah, I, I work for Choice Hotels. We use Pegasus stuff. Oh, wow. Really? And you guys and, know and you're show. still talking to me, which is awesome. Well, <laughs> I, I work in a different part. Of it. Okay. Oh, hey, this is the other cool thing about Scrivener before we go. It, you tell it to back up. It will back up anywhere you want. I have it backing up to the cloud right now. But uh, I strongly recommend you back up, especially with Scrivener. But it's going to do it automatically here. All right, that's it. So if Wi-Fi is on the cloud, how do you back up? No, it is not my fault. But I'm probably the guy who screwed up your rates. So, there you go. No, I was supposed to get the discount. It's so annoying because I went to, a, went to a hotel recently and like when we registered, I need to mention that in the room they had you know wired and wireless internet. And I get there and they had an Ethernet port and I plug in and I get nothing. So where do you live? I tried troubleshooting with them. Oh, we're on Wi-Fi now. We're Wi-Fi now. It's like yeah, but I wanted wired connection. And it's like they tried. You know, I wasn't getting lights off of it. It's like there was nothing plugged into the other end. It's like, oh. I don't know. What's your number? How many channels? Uh,